endoscopic ultrasound guided pseudoaneurysm embolization. This is a 54 year old male with a history of recurrent acute pancreatitis due to alcohol who presented with abdominal pain and lipase elevation with a CT showing signs of interstitial pancreatitis as well as this 2.2 centimeter pseudoaneurysm without active bleeding. He was medically managed for his pancreatitis which resolved. Two separate angiograms by interventional radiology did not show the culprit feeding vessel. After a multidisciplinary discussion, it was decided to pursue endoscopic ultrasound guided embolization of the pseudoaneurysm, given the high risk of spontaneous hemorrhage. The patient was transferred to our center. We performed the procedure in the operating room with general anesthesia and with the patient in the supine position. The patient was also consented for possible emergent laparotomy with surgical ligation with a surgeon on hand. Here on EOS, you can see the thick walled pseudoaneurysm measuring 24 millimeters by 16 millimeters. And here we show the aorta with the celiac trunk takeoff, but it is difficult to confirm which vessel is feeding into the pseudoaneurysm. However, the distance from the transgastric approach was fairly far from the pseudoaneurysm, and intervening vessels also made this approach riskier as was the case with the second portion of the duodenum, but a stable, shorter approach from the duodenal bulb was found. Here you can see from the inner diameter of the pseudoaneurysm measuring 28 millimeters by 15 millimeters with active arterial flow confirmed with Doppler. Here we puncture the pseudoaneurysm with a 22 gauge FNA needle. A 22 gauge needle accommodates the pushable 018 inch vascular coil we will use and potentially avoids the greater risk of hemorrhage than with a 19 gauge needle, which accommodates a 035 inch coil. The deployment is the same and has been described previously. On fluoroscopy, you can see our echo endoscope in a long position in the bulb advancing the coil. Because of this angulation, pushing the coil became actually quite difficult, requiring a hemostat to slowly push the coil out. We placed two coils that were 10 millimeters in diameter and 14 centimeters long. Typically for varices, it is recommended to use a coil with a diameter of about 20% wider than the vessel but here we were limited in diameter options and given the small neck of the pseudoaneurysm, it was unlikely that these coils would migrate out. Given the difficulty advancing the second coil, we did not attempt a third despite ongoing Doppler flow within the pseudoaneurysm. We then followed the coils with 1.5 milliliters of a 50-50 mixture of lapidol, a contrast agent, and N-butyl-2 cyanoacrylate, the glue agent. The coils serve as a scaffold for the glue to adhere to and reduces the risk of embolization as the glue quickly hardens. With the higher pressure and flow in the arterial system, this becomes even more important compared to variceal embolization. The downside of the rapid glue hardening, however, is that the needle can become occluded despite quickly flushing the needle with D5, as was the case here. So we had to switch to a new 22 gauge needle and repuncture as there was still some flow in the pseudoaneurysm. We injected an additional one milliliter of the glue mixture. Some centers use a hypertonic solution such as D50 to flush the needle and prevent glue occlusion, but we prefer to use an isotonic D5 solution to avoid any tissue injury from fluid shifting. On EUS, you can see complete thrombosis of the pseudoaneurysm with absence of flow and no evidence of hemorrhage from multiple angles. Here is the final fluoroscopic image. 
The patient was observed in the hospital and was clinically doing well. The following day, a follow-up CT with and without contrast was obtained to assess post-treatment. Here is the non-contrast phase, which does show a few new hyperdense foci in the spleen and the liver that represents small amounts of glue embolization. However, in the absence of symptoms and normal labs, it is of likely no clinical consequence, but does illustrate the potential risks associated with this procedure. Here is the contrast phase that shows no filling of the pseudoaneurysm, indicating complete obliteration. The patient was discharged in stable condition on post-op day three. No recurrent hemorrhage has occurred with over three years of follow-up. When endovascular interventions fail, EUS-guided embolization can be an effective strategy to manage pseudoaneurysms. However, there is a risk of cyanoacrylate embolization when performing these procedures. Use of vascular coils prior to injection or using rapidly polymerizing cyanoacrylate or other embolizing agents may help to minimize this risk.